Welcome to Gartner ThinkCast. I'm Karen Stokes Lockhart, and today we're coming to you with episode three of a series on the topic that is dominating all industries and functions, the so-called Great Resignation. At this point, 60% of HR leaders are significantly concerned about employee turnover, and 62% of candidates have explored a career change in the last year. Top that off with the fact that a recent Gartner survey showed 72% of candidates who receive a job offer have at least one other offer on the table. And it's clear that attracting and retaining talent is a top of mind challenge for all business leaders. Organizations are fiercely competing to attract and retain the talent they need to accelerate growth and performance. Before we move on, I suggest checking out Gartner's complimentary Future of Work Resource Center, which is full of more data and analysis on the subject and linked in the show notes. Now, without further ado, I'm excited to bring you a conversation between Graham Waller, Distinguished VP Analyst on Gartner's Digital Business Leadership Research Team, and Jamie Cohn, a Research Director in our Human Resources Practice, where she specializes in recruiting. They're here to talk to us about the biggest shifts they've seen in what employees and candidates want and how employers can best meet those needs and desires, even if they don't have all the money in the world. Over to you, Graham and Jamie. Graham, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Jamie, and looking forward to the conversation. Now, clearly, there's a new super competitive talent landscape. Let's start with the big picture. What are the biggest shifts you're seeing in what employees and candidates are looking for right now? It's interesting because I think people have always struggled to balance their work and personal needs, but before they felt like they had to make trade-offs. And what we're seeing right now is that people know they have a lot of options. They have a lot of offers on the table, potentially. Then we have the stress of the pandemic coming in and people are looking at the way that they have shown up for their companies during this really hard time and just asking themselves, is my company showing up for me? That leads to really one big thing that a lot of people are focused on, and that's being seen as a person and not just an employee. People are really thinking about how their jobs contribute to quality of life and not just quality of work. Quality of life really comes down to three big things. First, people are focused on emotional and mental well-being. We've gone through the stress of the pandemic. People are burnt out and they want to work for organizations that they see as taking care of their mental well-being. And the second is growth opportunities. Some people are looking at a change in career. And so they want an organization that will help them grow, not just in their role, but will help them to achieve different and kind career objectives than they've had before. And then the third which has been a huge focus for a lot of organizations, is flexibility. And I know, Graham, you've done a lot of work around that. Yes, Jamie. Flexibility is certainly a huge issue in this conversation. And it's linked to what's being done in future of work trends, and particularly the human-centric work design that we've been advocating. We're at a time when offices are reopening, and some organizations are putting pretty rigid expectations forward. For example, one-size-fits-all mandate that everyone must be in the office Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. And many employees are reacting to that, particularly those used to flexibility with working from home and enjoying some work-life balance from that, and they're choosing to leave their organizations. And there's another level, of course. Some employees have relished the opportunity to work from a new location, for example, closer to family or where they grew up. And certainly in countries like India, This is in contrast to pre-pandemic trends of moving to a tier one city to find a high paying job. Or we hear often many people saying they want to work closer to lakes or mountains or beaches in Europe or the US or Australia or wherever you are in the world. We're living in a time of great reflection. And a recent study we did found 58% of employees said the pandemic has changed their perspective on the desirability of their workplace location. So flexibility is really important and really valued by many people. Absolutely. And what's interesting to me about this is we even have digital nomads, people who are not just working from one place, but working from a different place every week. For me, I think I like my house and my familiar office and bed too much for that. But a lot of people want 
the option to take off and go to a different city for a few months and work from there. But the flexibility also isn't just about where. We hear a lot of people talking about flexibility and when they work. And companies are experimenting with a four-day work week. And even for frontline employees who typically have more rigid schedules, we're seeing companies give people more control over scheduling their own shifts. Great point, Jamie. And we call this flexibility of where, how much, and when people work radical flexibility in our employee value proposition work. Hopefully, we've convinced you that it's imperative to humanize your employee value proposition. Find the actionable guide linked in our show notes and delve into exactly how to create a human-centered value proposition that treats employees as people, not workers. Now, all that said, in terms of the importance of compensation versus work-life balance or flexibility, compensation certainly matters. I'm wondering, I know you're an expert in this area, what are you seeing regarding the salary piece of this equation? Well, when we're talking about recruiting and retaining talent, we can't get away from the question of money, that's for sure. Salary is definitely a big concern, especially with the inflation that we've seen here in the U.S., And we're seeing that candidates do expect a lot more in terms of comp, and they are getting it. So we have data from hiring managers where we ask them, when you're backfilling a position, what have you had to do to attract candidates to this role? And 41% of managers are saying they had to increase the base salary. And when we ask them how much, there was a wide range of responses, I think, from 10 to 40 percent, but the median increase was about 15 percent. And that's huge. That's as much as a lot of people get when they get a promotion. One of the interesting trends that we're seeing is that the competition increase is actually leading to people backing out even after they've accepted an offer. So one in four hiring managers has said that they've had somebody accept an offer and then later back out because they got a better offer. So of course, that slows down the entire hiring process, and it's very frustrating for everyone. Candidates have a lot of access to information on pay than they really had before. It used to be that you could go to Glassdoor and sites like that and get some information on what the salary range is, but in a very vague kind of way. Today, employees are talking with each other about pay to a much greater degree. In the last few months, I've even seen people on LinkedIn posting their entire salary history to give visibility into what that career progression has looked like. Then you have laws that are coming out in places like Colorado and most recently New York City requiring employers to share salary ranges. So employers should expect a very informed group of candidates and employees when it comes to comp. What a fascinating development and one that is blowing my mind on that level of transparency, especially in such a dynamic marketplace. I agree that salary is definitely a big concern. I particularly look at our global labor market data that tracks employee attraction and attrition drivers and compensation remains number one for many segments. But on the other hand, particularly during this time of great reflection that I mentioned earlier, many people are burned out. Working from home can feel like living in work. And a few are even flipping the script and describing it and seeking life-work balance instead of work-life. Not everyone is chasing money at all costs. So Jamie, how can leaders listening in, particularly those with limited funds to compete with digital giants and large corporate enterprises, Think about the trade-off between compensation and some of these other employee value proposition components we've been discussing. I really love the idea of that life work. We've seen those boundaries blurring quite a bit, and it gets to the heart of what people are looking for, which, as I said, is that quality of life. But look, there's some amount of money that nothing else really competes with. It doesn't matter how great your culture is or what your growth opportunities look like if you're paying 20 or 30% below other organizations. So there's likely going to be some struggle there. 
I think the good news is that most people are not just interested in money. They're not looking for that comp increase at the expense of everything else. In fact, only a quarter of people who were looking to leave their organization told us that the reason they were doing so was because they would get better compensation growth elsewhere. Coming back to your point about burnout, Graham, people are thinking really about how their jobs will support their overall well-being and growth. People want to be able to pick up their kids from school or take up a hobby. And overall, they're looking to feel valued and cared for. They want a sense of purpose. So things I've seen companies doing, some are trying to fight that meeting-centric culture and protect employee well-being by having meeting-free days or meeting-free blocks or providing other resources for mental health support. But it's not just what organizations are doing. It's also really important for managers to get involved here and model the kinds of behaviors that we know are important for employee well-being. So blocking off time on your calendar for an afternoon run. I actually did that just this afternoon. People need to know that that is okay and that it's part of the culture of the organization. So it's really about showing how you can drive that quality of life for people. It doesn't just come down to money. Money is not the only way to compete. I love the run example. I find that sometimes going for a run in the middle of the day gives me the think time I need to get creative. And so there's some other benefits as well. Manage talent risk, monitor the competitive landscape, and more with the latest data on talent availability, the skills market, and remote work trends. Our experts cover it all in the on-demand webinar linked in the show notes. But that sounds like great news, Jamie, particularly for employees that need to attract and retain talent in this climate and don't have all the money in the world, that I'm guessing many listening to us now. Yeah, I think the thing for companies to realize is that the things they've leaned on previously as perks are now considered baseline requirements. So differentiating yourself becomes much harder. Work-life balance, flexibility, remote work, those things are non-negotiables now. And when we start to think about things like return to the office, there are a lot of employees sitting there thinking, I have successfully worked from home for the past two years And what is the reason for me to come back in the office full time? It can feel very disrespectful. Yes. I've even heard some employees use the term betrayal. You know, quite honestly, they feel they've been betrayed by their organization, having put in so much effort, longer hours, leaning into their work through an incredibly difficult time. That feels harsh, but true. And managers can get caught in the middle of this. That's one of the factors why manager quality has jumped in ranks in terms of importance to employees. For some workforce segments, such as IT employees, manager quality has jumped to the number two attrition driver, just below compensation. People don't quit their job, they quit their boss. And it turns out that in challenging times, like we're in right now, having a good manager becomes even more important to employees. That is so true. Managers impact so much of our day-to-day lives. So, Graham, that makes me wonder, how can leaders at the top of their organizations equip managers to support their employees and really drive retention? Great question. I go back to this people first. Managers are people suffering and dealing with the same issues as well. So I think it starts with empathy and recognizing that managers are carrying a heavy and unfamiliar load right now, including things like managing in a geographically dispersed environment. Seeing employees as people that you so well emphasized earlier, Jimmy, is important by delivering in this more human-centric employee relationship and dealing with the perceived loss of management visibility. And then supporting and upskilling managers to lead effectively with empathy that involves being comfortable with more human-centric and more vulnerable conversations and entrusting employees by focusing on management by outcomes and not micromanagement of activities and inputs. Now, Jamie, I want to come back to a major shift that you mentioned at the start that we haven't yet discussed. More attention to employee growth opportunities. Why is that important? People have always looked for growth opportunities, but what we're seeing now is a bit different. People are thinking beyond their current role in organization and 
even beyond their current career path. So we're seeing people move from marketing to IT or from retail to customer service or from engineering to talent analytics, all sorts of shifts happening that are much bigger shifts than we've seen in the past. People are thinking about different ways to use the skills that they have and different ways to grow toward a job that fits better with their life. So we're seeing a lot more non-traditional career paths. And I'm also seeing that some people are looking to take a step back if it means having greater balance. So this isn't just a career progression. It's about finding the right fit career and the growth opportunities that will help you get there. Graham, I know that you uh, talk a lot with clients about upskilling and reskilling. So what are you seeing? Well, the first point is in today's new talent landscape, where it's so difficult and increasingly hard to hire, progressive leaders are instead betting bigger on their own people. A recent study found that upskilling and reskilling existing employees is the number one approach to close some of these critical skill gaps. And to your career change point, Jamie, in today's landscape, employee growth can look more like a career climbing wall than a traditional career ladder. It turns out that providing employees with growth opportunity also increases their intent to stay in their current organization by about 6%. Think about growth opportunities as an attractor of talent. So for example, many job descriptions have so many requirements that finding a candidate match can feel like looking for a purple squirrel, or some people say a unicorn. Instead, relax some of the criteria, such as a degree or three years of experience in a particular job, and instead find people that have the learning potential and provide them the skills development. They will see that as a growth opportunity and be excited. That's really interesting. And I know in my conversations with business leaders, sometimes there's a question about whether when we drop those requirements, are we actually dropping the quality of candidates that we're able to recruit? But the way that I think about it is that we are in such a different work environment now. We need to think about quality in terms of finding people who can solve problems, adapt, work in a cross-functional, collaborative environment and people who have the drive and motivation to stick with work through challenges uh, because there are no shortage of challenges in this fast-changing landscape. When you think about bringing in people who have different kinds of requirements, obviously there are some core skills for a job that you need, but you can find people who have that ability to solve problems and think on their feet and maybe could be great candidates to grow into that role. Essentially, you're finding your future leadership bench when you do that. It's a great point. And you caused me to think about quality different and quality in the way that you described it, Jamie, is more sustainable over time, which is so important as these skills and this talent landscape is going to continue to evolve and morph. Let me give you an example of this hiring and a technique we hear called development based on skills adjacency. So in something like data science, we see organizations looking for people either internally or externally with adjacent skills in statistics, in computing, maybe people that have been great power users with Excel or operational research experts and hiring them and then providing these growth pathways so that it can become data scientists that are, quite frankly, in many cases, almost impossible to hire. Let me give you another interesting growth opportunity that we're seeing emerging, and that's one of micro-promotions. Think about it in terms of more frequent interim advancements, and this is particularly relevant for many early career employees, such as Gen Z, who value feeling like they're continually progressing and not like they're treading water or stuck. And then, Graham, on the other side of that, we're seeing some people think about stretch promotions, which is the idea that you might bring someone into a role that maybe has a little bit less experience than you would traditionally look for. But let's say someone has been in their current role for a couple of years, and you might consider them for an opportunity that you would typically want them to have two more years of experience before you move them into that role. So the idea there is finding people who 
know your organization, who know how things work, and with the right support network, they can rise to that challenge and grow into that role. There's a bigger trend going on here around talent mobility. And as the needs change and as employees are rethinking their purpose, their career goals and aspirations, if we can offer more career mobility and give people the support, then we can solve a lot more of these challenges of attraction and retention. Now, Jamie, is there anything else that you think employers should expect? Just picking up on that theme of mobility, I know that we've spoken a lot about people leaving and the great resignation and all of that, but we should think about the other side of it, that people might also come back. So as we have more mobility in our careers, organizational boundaries are just a lot more permeable. People aren't just coming into a role, staying there for a period of time and then leaving, and that's the end of it. Those relationships can sort of come in and out. So people might leave a job for family reasons, to go get a graduate degree, to take a growth role in another organization. And you're not going to be able to keep those people every time. But if you treat them well, you can maintain that relationship and bring them back when the right opportunity opens up. And I know that there have been a couple of people on my team who have moved on to different kinds of opportunities. And I'm definitely keeping my eye on when we might have the right role to bring them back. And that strikes me as another great example of the importance of entreating employees as first and foremost people. Jamie, I started the discussion by asking you about the biggest shifts in what employees and candidates want. Can you summarize some of the takeaways from our discussion? For me, the connective thread through all of this is that it is about more than just compensation. It's about showing that you value your employees' well-being, their growth, and making space for their personal lives. It goes a long way for organizations, leaders, managers to give candidates an authentic view into how they can support employees. And just to add to that, leaders need to show how they support what matters in employees' lives right at this moment, this time of great reflection. Things like work-life balance, well-being, not just through benefit programs and perks. Jamie, I've enjoyed the conversation with you as ever, and thanks to all our listeners for joining us. It's been a pleasure, Graham. That was Graham Waller, a distinguished VP analyst on Gartner's digital business leadership research team, and Jamie Cohn, a research director in our human resources practice, in conversation about what it takes to attract and retain talent in a seriously competitive market. We'll be back wherever you listen to podcasts two weeks from today, when you can expect actionable insights about the evolution and increasing importance of organizational culture. In the meantime, please rate, review, subscribe, and share ThinkCast with a colleague so neither of you will miss it. ThinkCast is a production of Gartner. This podcast may not be reproduced or distributed in any form without Gartner's permission. It consists of the opinions of Gartner's research organization, which should not be construed as statements of fact. Content provided by other speakers is expressly the views of the speaker and or their organization. While the information contained in this podcast has been obtained from sources believed to be reliable, Gartner disclaims all warranties as to the accuracy, completeness, or adequacy of such information. Although Gartner Research may address legal and financial issues, Gartner does not provide legal or investment advice, and its research should not be construed or used as such.